Questions, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Le President, après les Mr. Speaker, after the attacks by Hamas nearly two weeks ago, there are Canadians who are still in danger. 4,000 Canadians are looking for help from the federal government to get out of Israel. About 300 Canadians are trying to leave Gaza. And between 40,000 and 70,000 Canadians are in Lebanon. What is the government doing to protect Canadians that are in danger? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since this is the first time we are all in this house, since the horrible terrorist attacks by Hamas, allow me to say this. Canada is with the state of Israel and the Israeli people. Canada is at the side of Israel and the people of Israel, and they can count on the continued support of Canada. We demand the immediate liberation of all hostages and unequivocally condemn the terrorist attacks done by Hamas. The Honourable Mr. Leader of the Opposition. Innocent lives, be they Palestinian or Israeli, Jewish, Muslim or Christian or otherwise, are all equally precious. Countless of those lives have been lost or put in danger as a direct result of the sadistic attacks of Hamas. And that was the purpose of those attacks, to exact as maximum damage on both Israelis and Palestinians and thwart any attempt for peace. We know that the regime in Iran was behind these attacks. And we know that the most powerful uh, uh, organizer of terrorism in the world is the IRGC, which operates legally in Canada today. Will the government accept the conservative common sense bill to criminalize the IRGC in Canada today? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. This is the first time we are all present in this House since these horrific terrorist attacks by Hamas on the State of Israel and the Israeli people. So I would like to begin by being very clear in English this time. Canada stands with the State of Israel and with the Israeli people. Israel can count on Canada's support. Canada condemns unequivocally Hamas's terrorist attacks, and we call for the immediate release of all hostages. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Last fall, the Finance Minister promised a balanced budget within six years. Last spring, she broke that promise and said that we'd have a balanced budget never. And last week, the Parliamentary Budget Officer revealed that her deficit is now 15 percent bigger than she said it was only six months ago. Is the has the government lost total control of our debt? And how much is this inflationary spending going to add to the interest rates Canadians pay on their mega mortgages? <laughs> The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will be providing an update on our debt and deficit figures and on our revenues in the fall economic statement in due course. When it comes to Canada's fiscal position, let me also be very, very clear. Canadians should listen to the independent ratings agencies whose job it is to evaluate Canada's position and not the partisan talking Canada down attacks of the opposition. Canada's AAA rating has been reaffirmed by ratings agencies since the budget. We are strong fiscally. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, apparently, former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley is just a partisan using talking points <laughs> when he says that this government's inflationary deficits are like pressing the, on the inflationary gas pedal 
and forcing the Bank of Canada to press on the brakes with higher interest rates. Canadian families have the highest debt load of any country in the G7, and those debts are colliding with the rates that this government is driving up. Will the Finance Minister cancel their inflationary deficits, balance the budget to bring down in interest rates and inflation, or will she admit that she's just not worth the cost? Yeah. Then I have this Premier Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me again bring some independent, non-partisan facts to this conversation. It is the job of the ratings agencies to determine the fiscal sustainability of every country's fiscal position. And ratings agencies have reaffirmed Canada's AAA rating. And you know why they did that, Mr. Speaker? Because we have the lowest deficit in the G7. And because, Mr. Speaker, we have the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. We believe in fiscal responsibility, Mr. Speaker, and the numbers show it. The independent nonpartisan voice that I'm interested in is the shipyard worker in Vancouver who told me that his mortgage payment has now risen to $7,500 a month. $7,500 a month for a shipyard worker and a middle class family. That proves that this Prime Minister, after eight years, is not worth the cost of mortgage payments. According to John Manley, Liberal Finance Minister, their deficits are driving up interest rates on the back of mortgage holders. Will she reverse these deficits so that we can bring down inflation and interest rates before the shipyard worker and millions of Canadians lose their homes? Yeah. Yeah. Then I have this Premier Minister. The Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, talk is cheap. But actions speak louder than words. If these Conservatives actually believed in supporting Canadians during the housing crisis, they would be supporting Bill C-56. Right. This includes a critical measure lifting the GST on all new rental construction that will get more homes built faster. The Conservatives should actually act in the interests of Canadians and not continuing to parrot their talking points, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I also wish to congratulate you. The United States created a group of five powers, including Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, and France, to speak with a stronger voice in the face of the crisis that the entire world is facing, which is centered on Gaza. Canada, disappointingly, was not invited to participate in spite of the importance of the Jewish community here in Canada. Did the government ask to be part of this group? The Honourable Deputy Merci, Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Canada is an important member of NATO, the G7. La semaine passée, j'étais à Morocco et les ministres de Finances du G7 étaient la première réunion en personne. This was the first in-person group of G7 ministers confirmed pour l'État d'Israël, our support for the state of Israel, the people of Israel, and together we condemned the terrorist attacks led by Hamas. The honourable member for Belle Chambre. Unfortunately, the United States State Department didn't see things that way because it simply did not invite Canada. And it's deplorable because it prevents the government from doing its work well for its own communities, its own citizens. This morning, I talked about the relevance and the opportunity for everyone here to talk along similar lines in order to defend the interests of the Canadian Jewish community and peaceful Muslims. If they could convene leaders to privately discuss the issues. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I 
very much appreciate the reality that all members of this House are facing members of the Liberal Party, members of the Conservative Party, members of the Bloc, and members of the NDP. We are all ready to show that for us, condemning Hamas's terrorist attacks and supporting Israel is not a partisan issue. It's a Canadian issue. That's the reality, and it's very important. Mr. Speaker, we are all shocked by the brutality, the kidnappings, and the targeting of civilians, including the elderly and children, by Hamas militants. And now, now the region is spiraling. Thousands of innocent Palestinians and Israelis have been killed in a conflict that they are not responsible for. Today we learned a fifth Canadian was murdered and we know more Canadians are amongst the captives. What is this government doing to ensure the hostages are protected and returned to safety? Then I have this Premier Minister. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I am glad to also hear the Honourable colleague from the NDP be clear in her condemnation of these terrorist attacks. It is very important to show that this is not a partisan issue for Canada. Clearly, I share and our government shares her concern for the hostages and we call for their immediate release. The Canadians are profoundly alarmed by what we are witnessing in Gaza. The UN has said that nearly half of Gaza's people have been forced to flee from their homes and that morgues are overflowing. This is a humanitarian crisis of extreme proportions. It took almost a week for the minister to start paying attention to the impact this war has had on Palestinians, even though thousands of people have been killed. Israelis and Palestinians have the right to live in peace. Why won't this government stand up for international law and call for a ceasefire? Here, here. <laughs> Deputy Prime Mr. Minister. Speaker, our government is very clear that we support the State of Israel and we recognize Israel's right to defend itself within international law. As the Prime Minister has said, we are deeply concerned by the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza. International law must be respected and Canada will continue to support civilians of Gaza facing urgent humanitarian needs. That's why we announced an initial commitment of $10 million in humanitarian assistance to trusted partners. Great Thank job. you, Mr. Speaker. But I have dictated Canada Calgary for long. After Forest eight Law. years of failed Liberal NDP policies, this finance minister experiences inflation much different than everyday Canadians. Her enormous inflationary deficits led to 40-year highs in inflation that caused the bank of interest rates to go up more than ever in the history, and they're just not worth the cost. After promising to balance the budget, her own budgeting watchdog called her out, proving Liberal deficits could reach almost $50 billion this year. I guess budgets don't balance themselves after all. Can the finance minister tell Canadians how much she's adding to the federal debt this year, or are we asking for too much? Mr. Speaker, our government will provide an update on the fiscal picture, both expenses and revenues in the fall economic update in due course. But let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, because I do not want Canadians to be misled by alarmist partisan talking points from the opposition. The reality, Mr. Speaker, is that Canada's position is fiscally responsible. We have the lowest debt and deficit in the G7, and our AAA rating has been reaffirmed by our ratings agencies. 
Then I have dictated yeah, Calgary, Calgary Force, Force Law. Law. This finance minister is known for speeding up just for the wrong reasons. By adding more debt than every government before them combined, she, she put the pedal to the metal on her deficits and revved up inflation. And unlike an Alberta highway, the consequences of her spending isn't just a speeding ticket. It's a bigger deficit, higher inflation that led to higher interest rates, putting Canada most at risk in the G7 for a mortgage default crisis. After eight years, they're definitely not worth the cost. Is the finance minister going to blow through her budget deficit projection? again buy more than six billion dollars yes or no the yeah. 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 minister of finance mr speaker our government will provide an update on our fiscal position on expenses and on revenues in the fall economic update in due course this fall. But I do want to be very, very clear on Canada's fiscal position. I was at the IMF World Bank Finance Minister's meeting just last week, and that is where it was so clear that Canada has the best, the lowest deficit, the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. Our position is enviable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's nice to welcome back the Finance Minister. I was beginning to think that she forgot the address of this location. <laughs> After eight years, Canadians are worried, are realizing that this government's not worth the cost. Canadians are struggling and this government continues to increase its deficits and inflation. Everyone now agrees that deficits increase interest rates. So will the, will the finance minister finally confirm for Canadians that she'll balance the budget so that interest rates can come down and Canadians can keep their homes? I'd like to remind members that we are not to make an indirect or direct relationship to whether the presence of the members in this house or not. As was because, as you know, according to the rules, members have responsibilities that sometimes takes them out of this place. I'll have more to say on this later on this week. The Honourable uh, Vice uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you for that important comment, Mr. Speaker, but I am happy to confirm that I was not in the House of Commons last week. In fact, none of us were because... Deputy Prime Minister has 20 seconds left on her clock. Last week was, of course, a constituency week. And I was proud to be able to do my job at the IMF World Bank Finance Minister's meeting, in particular because the G7 Finance Ministers affirmed our shared condemnation of Hamas and shared support for the State of Israel. The first time G7 ministers had met in person, Canada was at the table. That Again, I'd like... Again, I'd like to remind members that I'm quite well aware of the times that members have to ask and to answer questions. The Honourable Member from uh, Cinco North. Mr. Speaker, while households are dealing with higher interest rates, taxpayers are now on a bigger hook. That's because interest on the debt is going up. The government projected just a few months ago that it'll spend $44 billion on debt servicing costs this year, but that assumed wow. that interest rates would go down. Instead, interest rates have gone up. So will the Minister of Finance finally tell Canadians how much they're now on the hook for, for higher debt servicing costs because interest rates haven't come down? That's right. Then I have Vice Minister, Minister of Finance. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, our government will state Canada's fiscal position, revenues, costs, clearly in the fall economic statement in due course this fall. What the opposition clearly doesn't know or doesn't want to admit 
is that Canada's fiscal position is responsible, indeed is enviable, compared to our peer countries. This was reaffirmed by the independent ratings agency, DBRS Morningstar, which recently reaffirmed our AAA rating, and by S&P, which reaffirmed it after the budget. The Honourable Deputy de Charlebourg, the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Mr. President, the Director of Parliamentary Budget, Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer is expecting for the federal deficit to hit 40 or 46 billion next year. That's 16 percent higher than the original Liberal government projections. Interest rates are unlikely to go down before April of next year. During a housing crisis, that's a disaster. Can the Minister of Finance confirm that we're going to be paying six billion more in interest next year? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government will confirm budget numbers in the fall economic update. However, today, I want to highlight a very important reality, a reality that should be reassuring for all Canadians. Canada's fiscal outlook is very strong. Our deficit and GDP ratio is the lowest of all G7 countries, and our AAA credit rating was reconfirmed by credit rating agencies. Le député de Charlebourg, Haute Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, does the minister know that about 20 percent of mortgage loans are now at a negative rate, which means that they cannot pay more than interest? That's the inevitable result of increasing inflationary expenditures. No one listened, not the block or the liberals. After eight years of distress as management, will the liberals rein in their expenses to help mortgage payments go down so that Canadians can keep their homes? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question, but it's confusing to me that he would pose such a question when he has a plan that's actually going to increase the cost of building homes <laughs> and increase the cost of Canadians for living in them. His plan literally is to add taxes to home building this country and to cut funding that's going to build more homes for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, over the course of our time in this House, over the last number of years, we have repeatedly put measures on the, play, uh, on the floor that are going to help improve the affordability of housing in this country. Time and time again, that member has voted against them. Thank you so much. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, the Canada would be participating in decisions and having a role in this crisis. Mr. President, if the Canada is part of the group of five countries formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, distinguished from all Gazans and the Palestinian people. Last Tuesday, the UN called for a humanitarian corridor to Gaza for medical reasons. This is the basis of Article 3 of the Geneva Declaration of the Protection of Civilians, saying that the wounded and sick shall be collected and cared for. What is Canada doing in real terms to ensure that Israel does just that? The Honourable Minister for International Cooperation. Mr. Speaker, we are continuing with our long-standing position that in, in uh, in conflict areas, humanitarian access must be provided 
to civilians to ensure that there is access to life-saving uh, food, medicine, and water. We, I, I spoke yesterday with our trusted international partners as well as organizations on the ground, both international and Canadian. They have pre-positioned supplies. We are the first country that has moved forward to provide uh, much-needed humanitarian assistance, and we're insisting on that access so that we can deliver uh, to, to, to citizens and civilians who need uh, that uh, medical supplies. Well, to send help, first, we need a humanitarian corridor. We insist on it because Canada has been marginalized on the world stage. Once again, Canada sitting on the sidelines while the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France and Italy are all working together. That is not acceptable, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to human rights, Canada has a role to play and must insist on playing it. Has the minister spoken directly with Israel about opening a humanitarian corridor to Gaza? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, we're deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. A civilian is a civilian, and any loss of civilian life is deeply troubled. We continue to call for international law to be respected. The minister has been engaging directly with her counterparts in the region about the need for a humanitarian corridor to provide rapid and unimpeded access for relief, and she will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, the NDP Liberal government's wasteful inflationary spending is keeping inflation high and causing interest rates to be the highest in a generation. Canadians are facing tough choices, including whether they have no option other than to sell the family home. A Credit Canada representative told Bloomberg, quote, selling the house might end up being the only option for some homeowners. Wow. Last week, I heard of a nurse living in her car in the Okanagan. This Prime Minister Minister is just not worth the cost. When will the Prime Minister finally stop his inflationary spending so Canadians can keep a roof over their head? Mr. Speaker, I think it's fair to ask a question of the Conservatives when they talk about the inflationary spending. Are they talking about the programs that they're actually going to cut that are supporting people right now? Let's look at the measures that they're going to cut that they already voted against. Mr. Speaker, the question was about homelessness. When we put $1.3 billion on the table, they voted against it. Are they going to cut supports for the homeless? When we're talking about removing the GST so we can build more homes for middle class families in this country, they intend to vote against it. Are they going to cut that too? Mr. Speaker, when we put money on the table, for affordable housing. Time and time they vote against it. Are they going to cut that too? They are reckless. They are not worth the risk. We are here to support the middle class. We're here. Well, Mr. Speaker, this one was the same country. government that declared victory on inflation only to see it skyrocket. Right. James from Langley, B.C. told Global News that he and his husband are selling his home as a result of their mortgage payments and returning to the rental market. Mortgage defaults are climbing, with forced sales events up 10 percent, as just reported by the Toronto Real Estate Board. After eight years with this NDP Liberal government, people are being forced to sell their homes. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Right. Will the Prime Minister finally stop his inflationary spending so Canadians can keep a roof over their head? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to share with my honourable colleague that I recently had a chance to sit down with the Mayor of the Township of Langley to discuss their application of the Housing Accelerator Fund, which this member and her party is promising to get rid of. Yep. We want to be there for the cities to help the very kind of people that she's asking about her in her question that she promises to cut the support out from under should they form government. Mr. Speaker, if the honourable member is serious about building houses in this country, I would invite her to support Bill C-56, which is going to remove the tax on the construction of new homes, and I can't understand why they oppose it. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of Liberal government, we've seen compulsive deficits and unchecked inflationary spending. As a result, they've had a significant impact on increasing interest rates. According to Quebec's National Institute for Scientific Research, one in five Quebecers has difficulty repaying their debt and is likely to give up the keys to their home after 
eight years of Liberal government. Enfin Will this government finally understand that that managing things irresponsible, managing things irresponsibly is expensive for Quebecers and all Canadians? Now I have this the Minister, Honourable Minister Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Monsieur le Président, nous avons Mr. Speaker, we've just heard partisan arguments, but let me give you some facts. Canada Canada's position is responsible. We have a AAA credit rating, and that was reconfirmed by credit agencies. We have the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7. But if the Conservatives want to help us with the housing crisis, they need to support our legislation, C-56. That's the reality. De Vancouver, Kingsway. Millions of Canadians are going without their prescription medications because they can't afford them. Thousands die mm -hmm. as a result. Universal public pharmacare will cover everyone and save us billions of dollars. Yep. This weekend, NDP members sent a clear message to deliver it. Now, the Liberals themselves promised public pharmacare 26 years ago, wow. and their own convention delegates voted for it in 2016, 2018, and 2020. Will the Liberals keep their word and finally deliver the public pharmacare that Canadians need and want? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I have enormous uh, regard for my colleague. I know his commitment and passion um, to help reduce costs for Canadians is there. He would know, therefore, that the work that we've taken jointly with provinces and territories on bulk purchasing to see $3.5 billion in saving by working together to reduce costs for Canadians has happened. He knows that we've taken critical action on diseases, uh, rare diseases and drugs for rare diseases. He knows that we've taken critical action on patented drugs. And yes, we are having a discussion on pharmacare legislation. I look forward to a continued productive conversation as we look at all of the health cares and priorities in keeping Canadians safe and healthy. Then I have Deputy de Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Yeah. Oh, member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, it won't just save lives. Universal public drug coverage will save patients, workers, hospitals, and employers billions of dollars. It's time the Liberals took action. It's not just NDP activists who are saying it. All the studies and reports say the same thing. Even Liberal Party delegates voted for universal public primary care three conventions in a row. When will this government stop dragging its feet and deliver true universal pharmacare? Dans la ministre de la Santé. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Thank le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. C'est absolument and certain qu'on doit réduire One thing is clear: we need to bring down costs for drugs all across the country. And that's the action our government is taking. We are bringing down costs for almost three, by almost 3.5 billion dollars by buying medications together with the provinces and territories by pooling our purchasing and by working with our partners to find uh, a way forward. And certainly we are working with all members here in the House to bring down the cost of medications. Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the Leader of the Opposition continues to blame municipal mayors and councillors for our housing challenges, we've decided to work in collaboration with other levels of government, including our municipal partners. Our housing programs, including the Housing Accelerator Fund, incentivizes municipalities, nonprofits, and private sector to build more affordable homes, including purpose built rentals. Can the Minister of Housing and Infrastructure please share with the House the importance of working in partnership with other levels Excellent of government question. and other housing stakeholders? Mr. Speaker, let me take this opportunity to thank my honourable colleague for his advocacy as a chair of our housing caucus for policies that will help change the way that cities in this country build homes. What's more, Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague made an announcement last week on behalf of the federal government that we will be announcing more than $93 million in his city that's going to lead over the next three years to the construction of more than 2,600 homes and nearly 9,000 over the next decade. Mr. Speaker, we are going to require that cities build homes closer to transit, closer to post-secondary institutions, and I 
I look forward to continuing my cooperation with that member so we see more homes built in the city of Hamilton. Now I have deputy to Peterborough Kawartha. Canadians, Conservatives, we all know after eight years of this Prime Minister, he's just not worth the cost. But the Liberals and NDP still aren't receiving this message. Don't believe me? Take a look at the headlines. Average rent went up another 11% in past year, and even getting a roommate doesn't help much. Canada's rental crisis is getting worse, according to a new report that found that the average asking price for rent in September was $2,149, up by more than 11% more than a year ago. Enough. When will he stop his inflationary spending so Canadians can actually afford housing? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for her question, and I would point out that over the course of the past week, she attended the opening of a new affordable housing project that we funded in her own community, taking credit for a program that she, in fact, voted against. Mr. Speaker, the reality is, when it comes to housing, we have a plan to change the math so it works for builders. We have a plan to change the way that cities build homes. We have a plan to continue to invest in affordable housing and to grow the productive capacity of the workforce. Mr. Speaker, the opposition's plan is to raise taxes on home building and to cut funding that's going to build those homes. We're going to continue to build more houses to make sure that everyone in this country can afford a roof over their head. Then I have deputy to Peterborough Kawartha. After eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians can't afford a house, and that's the reality. And we will continue to vote against inflationary spending that is driving up household debt. Canadians are paying more on their on the interest of their debt. They cannot afford a home. This is from Vicky. My single 30-plus daughter and two grandkids just moved in because she could no longer afford her $2,500 plus rent. She had to give up her job to move back into town with me. So I'm basically supporting all three. So yeah, when will they learn how to manage money, decide about monetary policy, and actually build homes, not bureaucracy? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I assure you I am not making this up. She's talking about a lack of affordable housing in her community. We are literally discussing an affordable housing project funded by our government in Peterborough, and she voted against that particular policy. Mr. Speaker, Shame. she says she's going to continue to vote against these kinds of policies that are literally putting a roof over the head of some of her constituents, most vulnerable constituents in her community. Mr. Speaker, the honourable member has an opportunity to get more homes built in her community. She can support Bill C-56, remove the tax on new home construction, and invite some of her colleagues to do it. Now I have deputy to Charles, Charles Wood, St. James, Estaboa. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, a half a billion dollars in inflationary deficits have fueled 40-year inflation highs, causing the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates. In the midst of a housing crisis, mortgage defaults and forced home sales are on the rise. People are losing their homes. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister finally put an end to his inflationary spending so that Canadians can keep a roof over their head? Mr. Speaker, let me share some facts. Canada has the lowest debt to GDP ratio and the lowest deficit in the G7. That is a fact. Canada has a AAA rating. That is also a fact. And you know what else is a fact, Mr. Speaker? The opposition, which claims to care about the housing challenges Canadians face, is blocking Bill C-56, which experts across the country say is essential to get more rental homes built. That is sheer, utter hypocrisy, Mr. Speaker.
Don Arabe député de Montmagny, Lillet, Camorasca, Rivière, Rivière, Camorasca, Rivière, Lillet. Les politiques de ce gouvernement ont forcé la Banque du Canada aussi à forcer la Banque du Canada à raiser les taux dix fois. Et l'impact est dévastateur. Le dernier exemple, 20% des mortgages avec les grandes banques sont maintenant en négative amortisation. Cela signifie que le montant de paiement ne couvre pas les intérêts. Donc le montant de l'argent qui augmente est un loan qui ne finit jamais. Quand les libéraux mettront-ils fin à leur déficit déflationniste pour que les taux d'intérêt baissent et que les Canadiens puissent rester dans leurs maisons et les Canadiens puissent rester dans leurs maisons? Donnerable ministre. Donnerable ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. I'm looking forward to the day where the Conservative Party opposite will finally vote in favor of things that will do precisely what people need to help keep the roofs over their heads. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that they will vote in favor of the, what the construction professionals and the, municipality, the Federation of Municipalities have said they're delighted that we've cut the GST on the construction of new homes. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, based on an online consultation, the federal government has tossed out the Quebec winners of a competition to design a monument to the mission in Afghanistan. Well, the experts at Léger have studied that consultation, and they say the approach was not scientific. According to Léger, the results cannot be interpreted as the opinion of members of the armed forces. The use of these data generalized to the public is faulty. Mr. Speaker, the basis for eliminating the Quebec bid was faulty. Will they give the contract to the Dow team? Honourable Minister, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, I think we all agree on the importance of our veterans, and that's why the department conducted a poll. Over 10,000 Canadians answered the poll, and most of them were veterans. And the concept that was selected was by Stimson, and people felt that that better reflected the sacrifice and the bravery of our veterans. Mr. Speaker, we will always support our veterans, and that's why we chose the winning concept. The Honourable Minister, the Honourable Deputy, I'm excused. De Rivière des Milles. C'est léger qui dit ça. C'est léger qui dit ça. Les plus grands experts des sondages, ils disent que le sondage fédéral n'est pas scientifique et que les résultats ne sont pas utilisables. C'est rendu que même Louise Arbeau, une ancienne juge de la Cour suprême, a dû sortir jeudi dernier pour demander au gouvernement fédéral de respecter ses propres règles. On est rendu là, M. le Président. Il y a une limite à vouloir tasser le Québec à tout prix. To shut le gouvernement va-t-il respecter ses Will propres règles? Écoutez la juge à et attribuer le contrat à l'équipe d'Aou. Merci. Le ministre des Anciens Combattants. Merci beaucoup, M. le Président. Puis encore une fois, je tiens à remercier mon collègue M. le Commissaire all members here recognize the importance of our veterans, and that's why we conducted the poll. And the vast majority of respondents were included veterans and their family members. And they felt that the design we chose best reflected the sacrifice and the bravery of our veterans. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for my honor honorable colleague. Does he want us to ignore the expressed wishes of our veterans? The honorable member for Foothills. Spending and carbon taxes, food prices have skyrocketed, and many Canadians had empty tables at Thanksgiving. This is because of broken Liberal promises and a Liberal made financial crisis. Canadian grocery CEOs did not commit to meet the Liberals' lower food prices by Thanksgiving. Now, as a result, many Canadians can't afford to feed their families, a quarter are skipping meals, and millions of Canadians had to rely on food banks for their Thanksgiving dinner. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister end his inflationary spending so Canadians can afford to feed their families? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, 
While the conservative leader was having a self-aggrandizing, goodwill hunting delusion in an apple orchard, <laughs> our government was focused on stabilizing food prices for middle class Canadians. By calling on the five grocery chain CEOs uh, to produce action plans that would make a difference for, for Canadians. Our government is now uh, tracking and monitoring and holding the grocery chains accountable. Uh, while the Conservatives talk turkey, we'll talk results for Canadians. Hey. Colleagues. Colleagues, I saw that the uh, member from Foothills had difficulty hearing the answer to the question that he had asked. I ask that we try to keep it down. And to all members, I ask that they please use comments which will not cause disturbance in the House. The Honourable Member from Foothills. Broken Liberal promises and, broken, and Liberals making light of the food crisis does not put food on the table. Many Canadians are starving because of the Liberals' broken promise to lower food prices by Thanksgiving. That is not what happened. Food prices are up 7% over last year. Now, the Prime Minister promised to lower food prices by Thanksgiving dinner. He failed. Another broken promise. So will the Prime Minister promise to lower his out-of-control spending so Canadians can afford a Christmas dinner, or will that be another promise broken? who are doing so well on a day that was on a very sensitive issue internationally. I ask you to please continue with your good behaviour for the day. And I ask in particular the member Grand from Grand Prairie, uh, please, uh, to uh, keep the comment to the time that he is asking questions. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And on this side of the House, we continue to do the hard work to ensure that Canadian families are supported. Just look to our investment to create a nationwide system of early learning and childcare, or look to our Canada Child Benefit. On this side of the House, we are making investments to make sure that families can buy the food, can get the school supplies and the sneakers that their kids need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable... The Honourable Member from, um, from Dufferin Caledon. Well, Mr. Speaker, they must have a very def different definition of hard work than Conservatives have because after eight years of this Liberal government, we know that food prices are out of control. That's right. I went to the grocery store in Orangeville this past weekend for Thanksgiving. A loaf of Wonder Bread was $4.40. That's the definition of Liberal hard work. And how do we get there, Mr. Speaker? Massive inflationary deficits, a carbon tax that's driving up the cost of everything. The fake photo ops of the Prime Minister isn't going to fix anything. Well, they cut the carbon tax, balance the budget, so Canadians can pay for food. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is fighting for Canadians on affordability every step of the way. We're fully seized with addressing the affordability challenges that Canadians are facing by calling in the top five grocery CEOs to work with us to stabilize food prices. Conservatives can call this a photo op. I think calling decisive action for Canadians on affordability a photo op says more about them than it does about us, Mr. Speaker. Regardless of the Conservatives' attacks, we'll stay focused on the pressing needs of Canadians. Yeah. 
L'honorable député de Pontiac. The honorable member for Pontiac. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Small businesses uh, and medium-sized businesses are at the heart of Quebec's economy. And that's why it's so important for the government to support them at crucial points in their economic development. I'd like to hear what the Minister of Tourism and Economic Development for the regions of Quebec has to say about the PME and how they support them. 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 Et entre autres, like, celle créée par des femmes et aussi par des femmes autochtones. Support, uh, and and entrepreneurs. Merci, le ministre du Développement économique du Canada. Ma collègue a raison. Notre Thank gouvernement you, sait Mr. que Speaker, soutenir des idées right. PME dirigées Our par les femmes et les autochtones favorise la croissance inclusive de nos régions. En juin dernier, on a annoncé un financement de 100 000 dollars à Mini Tipi, une entreprise de Gatineau qui est d'ailleurs en nomination pour la la PME de l'année dans Gatineau, fondée par deux femmes brillantes, Trisha et Mélanie, célèbre la célébrité, la diversité, la richesse des cultures autochtones en fabriquant des accessoires de haute qualité. On est fiers de nos entrepreneurs et on est là pour les aider. Bonne semaine, TPMS. Happy Small Business Week. L'honorable député d'Edmonton, Millwood. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister's gatekeeping, anti-pipeline, anti-resource development policies, hundreds of billions of dollars of project investments have fled Canada and taken countless powerful paychecks away from Canadian workers. These Liberals just aren't worth the cost. Conservatives warned the Liberals that their plans to steamroll provinces by giving themselves unprecedented powers over provincial infrastructure, industry, natural resources through their No More Pipelines Bill, Bill C-69, was unconstitutional. Will they re repeal Bill C-69 now that the Supreme Court has ruled it unconstitutional? Yes or no? Yeah. I, I would like to correct my, my colleague uh, and uh, the fact that the Supreme Court last week issued an opinion. It was not a decision. But let me, let me give you some elements from... If, if the members want a briefing by the Justice Department on the difference, we would be happy to provide that to them, Mr. Speaker. Let me, let me quote from the Supreme Court on, uh, on what they said. This appeal is not whether Parliament can enact legislation to protect the environment. It is clear that Parliament can do, sir, under the heads of power assigned to it under the Constitution Act of 1867. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Exactly. Donald Deputy de Brantford Brant. Brantford Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this government's ongoing corruption, we have yet another scandal. Conflicts of interest, nepotism, abuse of power, and now we have allegations of criminality around the contracting practices in the top offices of this government. The $54 million price tag for the Arrive scam app is just the tip of the iceberg. Last week, the NDP Liberal Coalition voted to shut down the testimony of the Auditor General's review of this scandal. Why? But I have missed. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague knows very well that committees make their own decisions in terms of the work they want to do. What we have said, Mr. Speaker, is that at all times we expect people to comply with the contracting policies of the Government of Canada, and those that decide to do something that is worthy of a criminal investigation will obviously be investigated by the appropriate authorities, and we don't comment on investigations that the RCMP might decide to do on any of these issues. Après huit ans de gestion libérale, un scandale n'attend pas l'autre. On vient d'apprendre que la GRC a ouvert une enquête criminelle reliée à Rive Khan qui a coûté 54 millions de dollars aux Canadiens pour rien. C'est une firme de Montréal, Butler, qui a sonné l'alerte. Pour un contrat informatique, un haut fonctionnaire du gouvernement libéral a recommandé fortement à Butler de travailler avec la même firme de Rive Khan, JC Strategy. Cette entreprise de deux employés, sans bureau et sans compétences informatiques. Butler a mis le doigt sur ce qui ressemble à ce qu'on a vu dans le passé au Québec, M. le Président. Après huit ans, fermer les yeux. Est-ce que les libéraux vont nous dire qui devient plus riche à chaque fois qu'ils donnent un contrat? Oui. 
Then I have Minister. Yeah, well, Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said repeatedly, we expect all those who work for the Government of Canada to follow the contracting rules. Treasury Board rules and other rules that apply. In the case of these allegations, Mr. Speaker, there could be some criminal activity, and we expect the appropriate authorities to investigate, and that's precisely what this government will allow them to do. Then I have deputy the Scarborough Centre. Speaker, in communities across Canada and in my riding of Scarborough Centre, many Canadians are finding it difficult to find an affordable place to call home. Rather than scapegoating newcomers, we must work to ensure that they be a part of the solution to the housing crisis. Can the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship inform the House of our government's plan to tackle the labour shortage in the construction sector and build more homes for Canadians? Mr. Speaker, immigration is key to our economic growth, and now more than ever, we need skilled trades in this country. Uh, that's why this summer we launched the Global Express entry system into this country to make sure the skilled labour workers could get in here at a faster pace. Simply put, more workers at a faster pace to get all those homes built. We need those workers. We need them from abroad. We need them here. They'll get the homes built. Here, here. Deputy de Timmins Bay James. The planet is on fire, and we just had Suncor CEO Rich Kruger tell us how he's going to maximize profits for big oil while the rest of us suffer a climate catastrophe. In a year of record profits, they fired 1,500 workers. In a year of unprecedented climate fire, mm. their climate Shame. solution is to massively increase fossil fuel burning. Big oil is laughing at this government. I hate to interrupt the member. I hate to interrupt members. I hate to interrupt the member, but I'm having trouble hearing the member. Can the member please continue? He has 20 seconds left on the clock. Thank you, sir. Truth certainly hurts the Conservative Party as the planet burns and they're supporting the massive increase in fossil fuel burning, which is why they backed Rich Kruger from CEO. The question is, what concrete steps will this government take to hold big oil to account to protect Alberta jobs, Canadian communities, and our planet from the, com the fires that are happening from the climate crisis? Here, here. The Prime Minister of the Climate and the Environment. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I thank my honourable colleague for his question. In fact, our government uh, have taken and are taking a number of measures to ensure that big oil companies do their fair share when it comes to fighting climate change. We're the first G7 countries to have eliminated fossil fuel subsidies two years ahead of schedule, something that the Conservative Party of Canada would never do. They want to make pollution free, Mr. Speaker. We've also implemented measures to reduce methane emission by at least 40 percent by 2025 and 75 percent by 2030, which will make it one of the most ambitious measure in the world to reduce methane emission from the oil and gas sector. We have many more things coming, including a cap on the emissions of the oil and gas sector, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Monsieur le Président, après les dépenses indécentes des voyages internationaux d'acteurs non généraux, on a appris que son bureau a dépensé plus de 117 000 en voyages à Singapour depuis 2018, un average de 1,800 par mois. Monsieur, nous avons quelques calculs pour avoir des voies d'étalage sur les fournisseurs de la région. Au montant qu'elle a dépensé, j'arrive à une moyenne de trois outfits par jour, 365 jours par année. That's an average of three outfits a day, 365 days a year. Qu'attend le gouvernement? Why doesn't the government cut her $33 million budget? What are they waiting for? Because she's clearly incapable of managing taxpayers' money seriously and responsibly. Then I have Minister, the Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Canadian Heritage. Mr. Mr. Speaker, General the Governor General has done Canada, important work for Canada. Obviously, we expect every dollar she spends to be Merci, done uh, in a rigorous and conscientious way. Thank you. Well, this brings to the end of question period. I understand there's going to be a number of 
uh, points of order. Uh, I'd first like to recognize the Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, on a Thank point of Thank you, board. Mr. Speaker. In light of recent events, we have sought agreement from other parties, and I hope you will find unanimous consent for the following. That notwithstanding any standing order or usual practice of the House, Bill C-350, the Combating Torture and Terrorism Act, be deemed read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development. Que tous ceux qui s'opposent à ce que l'honorable député propose, la motion veuille bien dire non. Malheureusement, il n'y a pas de consentement unanime. Et puis, je vois le député de Simcoe North rappel à, North au règlement. On a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I very much uh, look forward to some of the guidance you have for uh, members uh, when you come out with it later this week. I hope you'll also consider how members can hold government ministers accountable for their willingness to show up for question period when, uh, when you provide your guidance. Thank you. I thank the member for his suggestion. It's not a point of order, but I will take it into consideration. Affaire courante ordinaire, dépôt de documents. Tabling of documents. Dépôt de projet de loi émanant du gouvernement. Of government bills. Déclaration des ministres. Statements by ministers. Je reconnais le très honorable right Premier honorable ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, today I rise to speak about the conflict in Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. Over a week ago, Canadians awoke to horrifying images coming out of Israel after the terrorist organization Hamas launched an attack of unspeakable brutality. J'aimerais faire le point sur les mesures que prend notre gouvernement pour aider et protéger les Canadiens touchés. Et j'aimerais ensuite vous parler des véritables inquiétudes que cette situation cause dans la population ici au pays pour les Canadiens de confession juive et musulmane, pour les Canadiens d'origine arabe et pour tous les Canadiens. Monsieur le Président, Parmi les milliers de personnes Mr. bouleversées Speaker, par cette violence, cinq Canadiens ont été assassinés violence, par les terroristes de Hamas. Trois Canadiens Hamas sont portés disparus et pourraient être tenus en otage. Je sais que les pensées de tous les parlementaires et de tous les Canadiens sont Canadians avec eux et leurs proches. Le de Canada demande au Hamas Canada de libérer asks tous Hamas les otages to free all immédiatement. The hostages immediately. Ten Canadian Armed Forces flights have departed Tel Aviv so far, with approximately 1,300 passengers on board. In addition, the first bus has departed the West Bank and brought Canadians to safety in Jordan. Le ministre des Affaires mondiales et nos ambassades dans la région travaillent sans relâche afin tirelessly. de leur venir en aide. Uh, travaillent sans relâche afin d'entrer en contact avec les Canadiens touchés et de leur venir to en aide. Et on collabore de près avec nos alliés et nos partenaires pour aider les gens à quitter We're Gaza, la Cisjordanie et Israël de la façon la plus sécuritaire et rapide possible. As well as the fastest way possible. Deeply concerned by the dire and worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Canada is calling for unimpeded humanitarian access and a humanitarian corridor so that essential aid like food, fuel, and water can be delivered to civilians in Gaza. It is imperative that this happen. Depuis la fin de semaine dernière, je me suis entretenu avec les dirigeants de toute la région, comme le, pré le Premier ministre d'Israël, Benjamin Netanyahu, le président de l'autorité palestinienne, Mahmoud Abbas, le roi Abdallah de Jordanie, le président des Émirats arabes unis et aujourd'hui le président El Sisi d'Égypte et l'émir du Qatar. J'ai discuté avec eux de la libération des otages canadiens et de tous les otages, de la fourniture d'une assistance 
issues humanitaires, de l'aide à apporter aux Canadiens pour qu'ils soient en sécurité, ainsi so that they de la paix et de la stabilité as well as dans la région. Peace and stability in the region. La ministre Jolie était sur le terrain Minister en fin de Jolie semaine. Was on the ground. Elle dirige nos efforts diplomatiques diplomatic en travaillant efforts, jour et nuit, et elle rencontre des Israéliens, night, des Palestiniens et d'autres partenaires de la région. And other partners in the region. Mr. Blair is working tirelessly to ensure that CAF evacuation flights are getting as many Canadians out of the region as possible. And Minister Hussein is leading conversations with his international counterparts with... I apologize to uh, interrupt the Right Honourable Prime Minister, but of course to remember that we are to refer to members by their titles, either titles as positions that they hold or as members of Parliament, but not by their names. My apologies, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of National Defence is working tirelessly to ensure that CAF evacuation flights are getting as many Canadians out of the region as possible, and the Minister of International Development is leading conversations with his international counterparts and with aid organizations, making sure essential support is getting to affected people. Canada has committed an initial $10 million in humanitarian assistance to provide essentials like food, water, emergency medical aid and protection assistance to those affected by the crisis in Gaza, the West Bank and Israel. And I want to be clear, none of this aid is going to Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization that slaughtered and brutalized innocent people. Hamas continues to commit unspeakable atrocities and are trying to instigate further acts of violence against Jewish people. Let me be clear about Hamas. They are not freedom fighters. They are not a resistance. They are terrorists. Terrorism is always indefensible and nothing can justify Hamas's acts of terror and the killing, maiming and abduction of civilians. But let me also be extremely clear that Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people nor their legitimate aspirations. They do not speak for Muslim or Arab communities. They do not represent the better future that Palestinians and their children deserve. The only thing they stand for is more suffering for Israeli and Palestinian civilians. Canada fully supports Israel's right to defend itself in accordance with international law. And in Gaza, as elsewhere, international law, including humanitarian law, must be upheld by all. Even wars have rules. Canada is always steadfast in our commitment to the rule of law. The rule of law is what we stand up for here in Parliament, what we advocate through diplomacy, and what we will always fight for, no matter the circumstance. Ici, au pays, Les émotions sont Here extrêmement in our country, vives. emotions are running Ça extremely high. En partie par le fait it can be explained in part by the fact that many of these stories are Canadian stories. En raison de notre diversité, That's due to our diversity. Many of us know someone who's been affected, or we know someone who knows someone. I met members of the Jewish community tragédie. grieving in the aftermath of this, strat of this tragedy. On a, on a des qui I ont was été told about young people who were shot musique. down during a music festival. De the de murder and âgées, kidnapping de femmes, of older people, of women, of children. De la communauté juive parlé Members of the Jewish community talked to jeunes. us Et about friends who died too soon and their attaque. fears of seeing their loved ones taken I hostage. I met with leaders from the Muslim and Palestinian community. They told me about how families in Gaza are spreading themselves between homes to prevent the possibility that they could all be lost in a single moment that from Canada, they worry desperately about their loved ones, but because electricity has been cut off, they have to rely on sporadic 15-second phone calls to know who is safe. Their worries aren't just for people overseas, 
the worries are about people here at home, too. Across our country, both Jewish parents and Muslim parents wonder whether their kids are safe at school. Families are worried about going to places of worship. Jewish people are wondering if they shouldn't wear their Star of David or Kippah in public. Muslim and Arab people are worried about being thought of as terrorists once again. The list of worries is endless, and the fear is real. There are rising into instances of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We saw the reports of hate crimes against a Muslim woman in Montreal and at a, he at a Hebrew school in Toronto. And all of our hearts break at the horrifying news that came out of Illinois yesterday. There are so many people in Canada who are afraid of the escalating tension here at home, who are scared as they watch horrible things happen to people in places that they love in the Middle East, who for years have lived somewhere between fear and hope, fear that escalation will tear them further apart and hope that one day peace could finally take root. Never forget that diversity is our strength. Canada welcomes people from all horizons who have a plethora of identities. We are a country of neighbors, of colleagues, of friends, of family. We represent that diversity and we live it every day. Now, more than ever, we have to unite. We have to avoid letting worries and suspicion separate us. Remember, it's a short path from mistrusting your neighbor to entrenching division. A peaceful society does not happen by accident and won't continue without effort. We live in a country that upholds the freedom of expression including religious and cultural expression, and every Canadian should feel safe doing so. This is the right and freedom every Canadian has under our charter. Canadian liberty is not about taking away the freedoms of others, but living in a way that expands and strengthens freedom for everyone. Monsieur le Président, comme Canadien, Mr. Speaker, as Canadians, we've proven that it's possible to build and define a country based on, anchored in, common values. Canada is not defined by one single identity, whether it be historical or ethnic or religious or anything else, but through shared values. We are, once again, at a moment where our shared values are being put to the test. Unrest is being felt in ways big and small. Canadians are deeply worried, no matter their background. This is why we must hold on to our commitment to the idea of this country. We've been tested before about who we are and what we are. But the core values of Canada have always been there to guide us, to make us stronger, to bring us together where, when forces or events try to divide us. Our diversity is our strength. We can never forget this. This is a time to reach out, to support one another. Ask a friend, a family member, or a colleague how they're doing. Reach out to members of a different faith. Offer to listen, offer to help where you can. People are not all right. So let's make sure they're not alone. As I've said before, the Canadian idea of liberty is an inclusive freedom, expansive freedom. Let's remember who we are as Canadians and what we stand for here and around the world. Respect for everyone's rights and freedoms and the rule of law, respect for different languages, ethnicities and religions, respect for human life, and respect
for each other. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. October 7th, Hamas carried out the worst attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. They deliberately targeted innocent mothers, babies, grandparents, partygoers, peace activists, and countless others who had no connection whatsoever even to military life. These were innocent civilians living their lives until they suddenly came to an end. The attacks unleashed a carnage that is almost unprecedented in human history. In fact, what was special about these attacks is the delight and the triumphal pride and exhibitionism with which Hamas surely carried them, carried them out. All of that reminds us that Hamas is not a militant organization. It is not a government. It is not an activist group. Hamas is a sadistic, criminal, terrorist death cult, and it must be defeated. Indeed, Israel does have the right to defend itself in accordance with international law, and it has the right to respond, just as Canadians would respond if an attack of this type were carried out against our people or on our soil. There will be and there can be no negotiating with Hamas. Hamas can only be destroyed, just like President Obama destroyed and assassinated Osama bin Laden. There was no negotiating with bin Laden and there can be no negotiating with Hamas. And this attack was also an attack on Canadians. If I could quote my deputy leader, in the carnage, five Canadians were murdered. And they're not just numbers. Alexander Luke from Montreal, Ben Mizrachiov of Vancouver, both murdered when Hamas opened fire on a music festival. Sheer Gregory was also killed. Adi Vital Kaplun, of Ottawa was murdered in her kibbutz, and Netta Epstein was murdered as she, sorry was murdered as he attempted to defend his girlfriend against a, a, a grenade. They are now in our memories forever, and may their memories be a blessing. Canadian citizens missing are believed to be held hostage among the 199 by Hamas who hold their people, their own people under siege in the gru their gruesome grip, serving as a proxy for the regime in Iran, imposing maximum terror on everyone in their path of destruction. Among the missing believed to be held, Vivian Silver, Judith Weinstein, Tiferet Lapidot, daughter of uh, Canadian citizens. Their fate is unknown, and Canada can and must do more to achieve their liberation, and we pray for their fate and their safe return." End quote. Meanwhile, a million Gazans are reportedly displaced. Many more are suffering and have lost their li or have lost their lives. Let it be said that the, Palestinian, the suffering of the Palestinian people is a tragedy. Every innocent human life, Palestinian or Israeli, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, or otherwise, is of equal precious value. All of us. All of us must do everything in our power to preserve this precious life and minimize the suffering of innocent civilians. Let us be clear, though, this is not incidental to Hamas's actions. It was the purpose of Hamas's actions. Hamas not only seeks the maximum suffering 
of the Israeli people, it seeks the max maximum suffering of Palestinians as well. Hamas has controlled Gaza ever since Israel departed from the Gaza Strip roughly a decade and a half ago, and it has worked diligently to preserve Palestinian suffering and prevent any opportunity for an easing of tensions or a future of peace. And we know why Hamas felt the need to act with such drastic cruelty at this time. Hamas, of course, is guided by its terror sponsor, the dictatorship in Tehran, which had been growing in its concern for Israel's signature of the Abraham Accords with the UAE, with Bahrain, uh, a, an agreement with Sudan, and even the possibility of normalization with Saudi Arabia. This kind of peace between Muslims and Jews, between Israelis and Arabs, would be a nightmare for both Hamas and for, Iran, for the dictatorship in Iran, who seek to, to perpetuate the conflict and the divisions as a source of power. They need to perpetuate the hatred in order to justify their dictatorships. And that's why they felt the need to interrupt any path towards peace. We all believe in a peaceful future that includes an independent Palestinian state, a, a two-state solution. And we believe that Israelis and Palestinians and other Arab, and Arab countries need to discuss that peace. And we, we understand that stability and security for the Israeli people is necessary for that to happen. There are concrete actions that Canada can take towards these goals. And I will list some of them, though they are not exhaustive, and I expect that my members will be raising more of them later tonight in the Take Note debate. First, Canada must criminalize the IRGC, the terrorist arm of the Iranian government. There is no doubt that these attacks carried out on October 7th had a degree of sophistication and coordination to them that would not have been possible without aid from an outside government actor. And that actor, of course, was the dictatorship in Tehran. That same regime uses the IRGC as one of the most sophisticated and far-reaching terrorist groups in the world. It coordinates between Tehran, Hamas, and Hezbollah. It is unthinkable that the IRGC can operate legally in Canada. It can raise funds. It can prepare logistics. It can, raise, it, it can recruit new followers. Some of the people attached to the highest levels of the IRGC live in Canada today. Their very presence terrorizing peaceful Canadians of Iranian descent who desperately want to kick these terrorists out of our country, and they are right. The terrorists must be kicked out, and this organization must be a criminal ent entity in Canada. <laughs> Second, we, we call for Hamas to immediately release all hostages. Third, we want a, 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 a complete review of all aid programs to make sure that not one penny goes to terrorism. Fourth, we need to protect places of worship of all different backgrounds. We know that synagogues, potentially mosques, and other places of worship, we, we already know that these places have been targeted in the past in Canada. Prior to this recent incident, we know that Muslims have been the victim, victims of hateful and murderous attacks by monsters here on our own soil. We know that synagogues are now facing attacks by anti-Semites. We know that churches have in the past been burnt down. All of this to say that we need to protect all of our places of worship. We need to debureaucratize and simplify the federal programs that provide security infrastructure at places of worship so that every single Canadian, regardless of their belief, can feel safe when they go to worship with their fellow. <laughs> As I said at the outset, and as I say again, the lives of innocent Palestinians and Israelis are of equal value. And to that end, we believe it is urgently important to 
minimize the suffering and protect the lives of Palestinians who had no part in these attacks. And that includes by supporting safe zones for civilians in Gaza, by backing a humanitarian corridor for food, water, and medical supplies. It means that we should support the evacuation of foreign nationals through Egypt. And it means that we must do a comprehensive review of all of the aid we are sending to, to Gaza to make sure that it actually re reaches the Palestinian people and not the terrorist thugs in Hamas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, years ago when a terrorist attack happened in uh, the United States of America, uh, one commentator said that almost trying to absolve the attack, said that we needed to look at the root causes of terrorism. Well, the root cause of terrorism is the terrorist, which I said at the time to the great horror of my critics. Some of them said that the statement was too simplistic to be true. Others said that, it was so, uh, that the statement was so obvious that it needn't be said at all. But in reality, it is neither. It is both simple and true, and it is perfectly the summary of the liberal democratic worldview. Our view is that each individual is responsible for their own actions. The root cause of terrorism, therefore, is not Islam or Christianity or Judaism or any religion. It is the individuals who carry out the terrorism, and this is important because it means that when we see vile action, actions carried out by people purporting to act on behalf of a religion, we do not blame all of their supposed co-religionists. We do not blame Muslims for the actions of Hamas. We do not target our fellow Canadians because of something that has happened on the other side of the world. Here in Canada, we judge people on their own merits, their own deeds, and their own words. That is why the great Canadian Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier said when he was asked what is our nationality, he did not list an ethnicity or a religion or any other superficial demarcation. Back then we were already mixed up. We had obviously indigenous people, Scots, Irish and many people from all around the world in our country and therefore we could not define ourselves on any of those lines. So he said, Canada is free and freedom is its nationality. And so it is today. And so let us then set out to protect the freedom of all Canadians and to stand for the values of freedom all around the world. Let us support our Jewish and Muslim friends here in this country as they watch with horror and with sadness at what is happening to loved ones on the other side of the world. They too are Canadians. They are our people. We must stand with them now and always because after all, we are Canadians. Thank you. Merci, M. le Président. D'abord, je veux, en mon nom et au nom du Bloc québécois, adresser nos condoléances aux Québécois et aux Canadiens qui ont perdu des proches dans les attentats terroristes du Hamas en Israël. Je veux aussi adresser nos condoléances à tous les Israéliens qui vivent une situation éminemment dramatique, de même que tous les Gazaouis, civils, innocents, qui subissent des drames de nature comparable. La seule, finalité, la seule finalité des gestes que nous posons doit être une finalité humaine, avant même d'être une finalité humanitaire, une finalité de compassion, de compréhension, d'être capable de se mettre à la place de l'autre, d'oser fermer les yeux quelques secondes et d'imaginer si c'était nous 
ou des proches de nous. La finalité doit être la reconnaissance et les gestes allant dans le sens du droit à la sécurité qui est celui de tout être humain. Dans le passé, M. le Président, nous avons, beaucoup d'entre nous, dont le Bloc québécois, formulé des reproches à l'encontre de politique d'Israël. Mais malgré tout ça, nous avons observé, sans y croire au début, la violence abjecte de l'attaque du Hamas. Et nous l'avons dénoncé pour ce qu'elle est du terrorisme. Imaginez un instant qu'au moment où on se parle, nous soyons des Belges. Alors qu'un attentat vient d'être revendiqué par un terroriste s'inspirant de l'État islamique, attentat qui a tué au moins deux personnes dans les dernières heures. Cet attentat a probablement été alimenté dans son intention par les propos haineux et les invitations à la violence qui ont été formulées non seulement par les dirigeants du Hamas, mais qui ont été répétées dans les rues des villes et des capitales des grands États occidentaux. Nous devons nous demander, M. le Président, si notre réponse face à la propagande activement haineuse et l'invitation à la violence est adéquate, si les moyens dont nous nous sommes dotés sont suffisants face à la réalité telle qu'elle se définit maintenant. Monsieur le Président, parce qu'Israël n'allait pas rester exposé à une telle menace, parce qu'Israël ne pouvait pas s'en remettre à l'autorité palestinienne, parce qu'il faut, qu faut déraciner le Hamas pour avoir ne serait-ce qu'un espoir de paix durable dans la région, Sahal va entrer dans la bande de Gaza. Je veux croire que le rassemblement des troupes israéliennes aux frontières de, de Gaza, dans l'attente, au moment où on se parle, dans l'attente, je veux croire que cette attente a notamment pour but de permettre l'arrivée et l'intervention humanitaire que les civils palestiniens de Gaza attendent et espèrent de tous leurs voeux. Ils en ont besoin. Ils en ont besoin. De la même manière, on doit espérer que le chemin menant vers la relative sécurité de l'Égypte sera ouvert maintenant, dans les prochaines heures. Comme les autres chefs, je veux souligner la nécessité de ne pas confondre le Hamas et les civils palestiniens dont ils se revendiquent pour monter leur terrible dessein. Une famille palestinienne et une famille québécoise, c'est la même chose. Le Hamas a révélé toute la noirceur de son dessein. Ils ne veulent pas la paix pour les civils de Palestine, ils veulent la guerre pour tout le monde. Et Téhéran sourit. La haine est un mal profond qui s'inscrit et se nourrit d'une lecture parfois tordue de l'histoire. La haine, au Québec et au Canada, elle est dénoncée et doit l'être. De même, le Canada ne doit pas rester en marge des grands mouvements et demander à joindre ses alliés dans la réflexion et la coordination d'une stratégie occidentale pour que cessent rapidement les hostilités et que ne puisse plus réémerger la créature qu'on appelle le Hamas. Si le Canada joint le groupe des cinq pays dont on a parlé un peu plus tôt, donc, les États-Unis qui ont pris l'initiative, le Royaume-Uni, la France, l'Italie la... et l'Allemagne, il sera probablement à même d'améliorer l'efficacité de l'évacuation concertée des Québécois et des Canadiens qui sont en Israël. Il sera aussi davantage à même d'améliorer les chances de libération des otages canadiens. Il pourra plus efficacement ajouter sa voix aux demandes des États-Unis, de l'Europe et de l'ONU pour une intervention humanitaire immédiate. J'invite aussi de nouveau le premier ministre à convoquer 
once again, à un moment qui conviendra à chacun, les chefs de tous les partis, que nous puissions être informés leaders, privément, avec tout le respect de la confidentialité que ça pourrait commander, les développements dans cette crise qui touche tellement crisis, de nos citoyens. Dans l'intervalle, un intervalle que nous souhaitons tous interval, court, nous one, sommes de tout notre cœur, nous out, sommes de toute notre compassion et nous sommes heart, parfois même de toutes nos larmes avec les victimes tears, de cette violence et nous. Merci, M. le Président.